is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Well, we're going to follow the psalmist's command and sing together from number 203 in these blue books of ours. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, hallelujah, oh praise him. Number 203.
Well, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. What joy and gladness indeed fills our hearts, O Lord our God, as we sing your praise and in doing so are reminded of who you are, the God who has made all things, the beauty of this vast universe, whose every complexity and variety an intricate wonder. Speak of your greatness, your power, your sheer creative delight. And as we think of all the blessings that pour into our lives day by day, the abundance of your goodness, a goodness that you lavish on the just and the unjust, so broad and bountiful is your generosity of heart. And as we think of the wideness of your mercy, which truly does span the whole globe and every tribe, every tongue and people and nation from which even now you're calling people to know you, to love you all over this world through the gospel of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. How right we are to sing hallelujah, to sing praise to you, the God of gods, the Lord of lords, whom you have made known yourself to us so wonderfully in the Lord Jesus. King of kings, creator of all that we see and all that is unseen. And yet, Lord, still as we've sung, you are the one to whom we may all, whoever we are, may all cast our care. And you are the one to whom all may come who bear great pain and great sorrow, knowing that they will find most surely and indeed forever, will find rest and solace and peace peace that passes all understanding of this world, all because of the grace, the mercy, the sheer and deep everlasting love made known in our Lord Jesus Christ, your own Son, who came to love us so fully, so clearly, so wonderfully in the cross of Calvary, where you, our Lord and our God, bore our sins away forever so that we might be saved. In your own death, our sins were carried far away and forever. And through that great resurrection to life everlasting, we as your people also have hope Indeed, we have the great assurance in the face of our frail mortality of a future that is assured and of a life to be shared with you, our Lord and our God. So, Lord, it is as the people of the Lord Jesus Christ, the people of joy, the people who sing hallelujah, that we come into your presence this morning together, delighting in your name and rejoicing in the hope that is ours in Jesus. And so we ask, Lord, that you would come among us by your Holy Spirit, real and present and intimate in our midst, to open our eyes afresh again to the glory of your gospel and to open our hearts more to the delight of your love. And so to encourage us, to help us, to lift us up and to send us out into this world to share the good news of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And so it's in his name that we ask and pray. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed uh, to all of you this morning, very especially if you're here for the first time. Uh, I guess there may be uh, already a few new students among us uh, coming to study here in Glasgow at our universities and uh, perhaps other visitors 
uh, visiting with us temporarily or perhaps even new to the city. And if so, then you are very welcome indeed. And uh, our fellowship here welcomes you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You should have uh, one of these uh, notice sheets on your chairs. I hope you do. We didn't have them in Kelvin Grove this morning because Paul left them at home. Naughty Paul. But we do have them here because we're more efficient up here. And uh, you've got them here. So on the front page, you'll see there, that tells you all our services going on uh, today. You'll see that we meet again this evening here at 6.30 for our English service up here. Uh, and uh, Phil Copeland will be preaching uh, downstairs uh, will be the Farsi congregation. Do pray for Josh. He's preaching this morning up at uh, Grace Church Dundee, one of our partner churches. And uh, we pray that that will be an encouragement to them. So do come and join us again this evening. Uh, if you speak English, come upstairs. If you speak Farsi, go downstairs. If you want to learn Farsi, go downstairs. And uh, there's something for everyone. Inside, uh, you'll see on the left-hand side some details about uh, what goes on for children this morning and various other details and so on. On the right-hand side, uh, various ministries going on throughout this week. If you want to find out more about those, speak to somebody after the service. Uh, there are also cards inside the, uh, the church Bibles. If you want to get details about that, fill one of those in. Uh, stick it in the offering basket or give it to somebody afterwards and uh, we'll try and get you details. There are cards in the various racks at the doors as well that give you details about these particular ministries. But you can see there a number of things going on. Let me just mention particularly the small groups that meet on Wednesday evenings, alternate Wednesday evenings. And uh, if you'd like to know more about that or be involved in those, uh, a number of those meet here. You can just turn up here and uh, be part of one of those groups uh, or uh, be in touch with Paul Brennan and he'll tell you about other ones meeting around uh, the city. We're praying for Al and Kalila, who are married on Saturday at uh, Kelvin Grove, and you'll see friends are, are warmly invited to come along and join with them uh, in that service. On the back page, uh, under Nota Bene, again, special welcome to students, and you'll see there that uh, over the next three Sundays, starting next week, there will be various events and uh, student lunches taking place after the services. So you're warmly invited to come along and uh, join in with those. Christianity Explored is uh, a seven-week course that we run regularly, introducing people to the Christian faith through the Gospel of Mark, taking you right back to the original materials to hear the words of Jesus, read of the works of Jesus, and understand that for yourself. And uh, that's a great course, a great thing to come along to, to bring a friend who's not a Christian, to bring a relative, perhaps, who needs to uh, discover the Christian faith, or perhaps for yourself, if you just want to brush up on what it is that uh, you think you believe. There's no better way, really, than by sitting around the table with Mark's Gospel open. You can invite, uh, invite friends. You can ask uh, all the questions you want to, and uh, that's going to be beginning, uh, you'll see, on the 27th. So we uh, commend that to you. There's also the leaflet there uh, for the Scottish Women's Bible Convention. Do take those away, ladies and uh, peruse those. Lastly, I want to uh, make a special welcome to Honey Kumar, who is at long last come to be with us from all the way from Delhi in India. Honey, stand up so people can see you, because we've been praying for this brother and for his visa. Yeah, again, a round of applause. <clears throat> Honey has come to be with us for the year from the Delhi Bible Institute, where he works, and uh, to study at Cornhill and uh, we're delighted, honey, that you've made it, and uh, we're very, very glad uh, to see you here this morning. So welcome. I'm falling apart. We will turn to uh, our Bibles now, and we're going to read together in John's Gospel, chapter 19. You'll find that, I think, in the Church Bibles on page 906, and uh, Edward has been leading us through uh, some studies in these chapters 18 and 19 of John's Gospel. And we come this morning to the final study and to this uh, extraordinary passage, really, where John speaks to us about the death and the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're reading then from John uh, chapter 19 and at verse... 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all now was finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a full sponge of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. 
When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Amen. And may God bless to us his word. Well, we're going to sing together again from our blue books at number 23C, which is a version of the 23rd Psalm, the Psalm of the Great Shepherd, the King of Love, my shepherd is, whose goodness fails me never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever.
Well, now uh, our offerings for the Lord's will be taken up. Uh, as uh, we do that, we're going to show a little video that explains uh, one or two changes that are taking place uh, quite soon in the way that we organize our services here. Basically, our uh, evening service, which currently we hold here at uh, Bar Street at 6.30, is going to move to our Kelvin Grove venue. And uh, the Farsi service, which is uh, bursting out from the rooms downstairs, uh, is going to move up here uh, where they'll have more room. But there are a few arrangements uh, to come to terms with. So as we take up the offering, the little video explains why we're doing it and uh, what will be happening. ...to Kelvin Grove and the Farsi-speaking congregation from downstairs up into the Grand Hall. And the reason simply is that we're pretty full. Uh, especially in term time, uh, the Grand Hall is really very packed on a Sunday evening and it's quite off-putting to people who are coming late and can't find a space to go and some folk feel quite claustrophobic. And certainly there's no room to grow. When you go downstairs to the Farsi congregation, it really is very, very full and we've nowhere else to spill into. So if we are going to grow, not decline, if we're going to have more space for people, not less, we have to change and move. And uh, the Lord has given us great resources for the gospel uh, in the buildings that we have in the different locations. And we want to use them uh, as wisely as we can and uh, as much as we can for the sake of the gospel. Now, there are some practical issues that we'll have to face. There are a few people who uh, come by public transport to the city centre, and Kelvin Grove will be a bit harder. We want to make it possible for everybody to be part of the service who wants to. We are happy to try and arrange people to have lifts and to, to come with others. And all you have to do is phone the church office or email the church office, and uh, we'll be happy to help. Uh, it'll mean a great benefit to students from Cali and Strathclyde because they will automatically be able to increase their number of daily steps on a Sunday. Uh, at the moment, they don't have to walk far enough, and uh, this is going to be great for their health and fitness. By contrast, Glasgow students who have been walking much further for a long time are going to have a little while of rest, but uh, they can walk around the building a few extra times uh, to make up their steps. There are one or two other practical things that will be really useful as well. At Kelvin Grove, the parking is a lot easier than it is here in the city centre. We've also got the church car park, which can be reserved for folk with uh, you know, mobility difficulties. But there's tons of parking in the streets round about, and that, that's certainly a great benefit. One of the challenges will be for those who are serving in the Farsi ministry. Some of them, uh, one spouse will be at Kelvin Grove, another will be here. Uh, and uh, various things like that. And again, you know, that'll be a little bit harder, a bit more of a challenge, but that is the nature of gospel ministry. And so I, I, I want to encourage us all, when we think about this move, to think about the gospel opportunities and the advantages that there are, not just the, the, the hassles or the practical changes there might be for us. There will be some of those, let's face it, no point of pretending. But um, the gospel will not grow in the city or in our church and in the rest of the world without God's people being willing to make sacrifices and God's people being willing to take the opportunities when they're there. And uh, we want to be a church that is using everything that God has given us to maximize our opportunities uh, for ministry. And we hope that this is what uh, this move will do. So we're going to try from the beginning of October through till the new year. We'll see how things go. We may have to change uh, other things. We may have to change the times, uh, make certain adjustments, but those are all things we've done before. This is a very small move in comparison with some of the moves we've made as a church. And uh, let's be praying together that God would help us to use this to grow his gospel and his kingdom in our church and in our city. Let's pray together now, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we do have so much to give you thanks for. And we thank you that uh, at this time we are needing to make certain changes because of growth in numbers of people coming, especially because of so many who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in recent months and years. And we give you great thanks for your goodness, for the glory of Christ which is being made manifest in so many people's lives. We thank you especially for so many brothers and sisters from the land of Iran who, having fled from an oppressive regime, have found not only the peace and freedom of our nation, but so many of them who have found so much more, the eternal life and joy and peace that is to be found in Jesus Christ alone. 
And so we ask, Lord, that as we uh, face these um, changes in our arrangements over the coming weeks, that you would give us all a great and a deep desire to see the gospel continuing to grow, not only in our church, but in our city, in our home nation, and indeed from here to the ends of the earth. We thank you, Father, for the many partnerships in that gospel that we are so privileged to share in as a fellowship and with so many others. We thank you for bringing our brother Hani Kumar here and also Gloria Shaw all the way from Delhi to be able to train alongside us here to be better equipped to minister the gospel in that vast and populous continent. We thank you for the work of the Delhi Bible Institute and its satellite centers across North India where their desire is to continue to work and to pray until North India hears the gospel, 600 million people. We pray, Lord, that uh, our brother and sister in their time with us here would find so much that will help them in the future. That not only will they be a blessing to us here, but that we as a fellowship would be rich in blessing them and sending them back to that part of the Lord's harvest field. We thank you too, Lord, for the partnership we have with so many students in our city and the different universities and colleges. And we pray for all the work that will be going on in the coming week or two as Freshers' Weeks begin and the Christian unions begin their many different particular events seeking to reach out with the gospel of Christ to those who are new or returning to study here. We thank you for every opportunity that these avail. And we pray for every conversation that is struck up, for every friendship that is made, that those who are yours in the student body of our city would see their time here not only as one of enrichment intellectually and socially and in so many other ways, but also, crucially, one of great service to Christ the King. That they would use the time here to share the gospel of Christ with those with whom they study and work each day and each week, and also take the opportunities that are presented to them for training and developing and growing in the Christian faith themselves so that throughout their lifetime to come, having been fitted for the work of the gospel, they might fulfill all the days of their lives the greatest and the most significant calling of their lives, which is to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, to love him, to follow him, and to make his name known in all the earth. We pray also, Lord, very especially for the beginning of the term of the Cornhill training course tomorrow. We thank you for the, some 45 students who will return or come to begin the course for the first time. We ask for each one of them that you will encourage them and help them in their studies as they seek to devote themselves to learning how to read and understand and share and teach the glorious message of Christ in all the scriptures. We pray that from among their number, there would be many who through this time of preparation would be fitted for a lifetime of gospel service in whatever sphere or realm that is and which you choose for them. We pray very especially for the teaching staff, the administrators, and all of those who work together to enable that training to happen. And we ask, Lord, for your great blessing on all that goes on in this term to come. And as we think, Lord, of our own church once again and of our city here, we remember the words of Isaac Shaw, the director of DBI, when he spoke to us just a few weeks ago here, telling us, of the vastness of the work to be done in North India, but also of the uniform and united commitment of all of those working in conjunction with the Delhi Bible Institute, that North India should hear the gospel. How moving it was to hear the words with which every time they meet as a team, they part, saying to one another, life would not be worth living if North India does not hear the gospel. Lord, may we be a people here whose parting thoughts and parting words perhaps 
and ongoing prayers are the same every time we meet, that you would make us truly a people for whom life would not be worth living if the people of our city do not hear the gospel of Christ. So to that end, Lord, we pray that as we come to your word this morning ourselves, you would again open our eyes and our hearts afresh to the glory, the wonder, the beauty, and the truth of your glorious gospel and send us on our way with burning hearts and with loosened tongues to share this life-giving message with others. So hear us and help us in all this we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Edward comes to preach to us then, we're going to sing once again from our books number uh, 429. It is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be, that God's own son should come from heaven and die to save a child like me.
Well, friends, let's uh, take our Bibles and turn to the 19th chapter of John's Gospel, which you'll find on page 906 if you have one of our hardback Bible copies. And as Willie said earlier, uh, we're finishing off this little series in John chapters 18 and 19 that uh, we've been following in recent weeks. And the main section I want to concentrate on this morning is the, the final paragraph of John chapter 19, verses 38 to 42, which records the burial of Jesus. Now, we reached the high point of John chapter 19 at verse 30, where Jesus actually dies. And just before he dies, he cries out that great word, tetelestai, meaning it is finished or accomplished. The work is fulfilled. But you'll see that John, the evangelist, is not content to pass straight from the death of Jesus at chapter 19, verse 30, to his resurrection at the beginning of chapter 20. He feels that he must tell us about the final hours of that Friday afternoon and evening after Jesus had died. Now, the Apostles' Creed reflects exactly this concern. You may remember the words of the Creed at this point as it speaks about Jesus. It says, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. So the creed doesn't move straight from the crucifixion to the resurrection. It insists that we think about and understand the fact that Jesus died and was buried. And John is telling us the story of his burial here with various comments and implications as he goes along. John wants to tell us the facts of Jesus' burial because he wants us to know that Jesus really died. And we'll come back to that important point in a moment. Now, before we look at the text itself, let's remind ourselves what the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are doing as they write up their account of the gospel, of the, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. These four men, the evangelists, are not simply the objective recorders of historical facts. Now, they do record historical facts, but they're much more than that. They're teachers. Or you might say the facts that they record are not mere facts. They're facts with a message. These facts mean something, and their meaning is crucially important. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not unconcerned or aloof historians. They're evangelists, and they want to persuade us of their case, not so as to make us their disciples, but to bring us to believe in Jesus so that we should be his disciples and so that we should enjoy eternal life. The historical facts that the evangelists present us with are quite simply the most important things that have ever happened in the history of the human race. So John is saying to us, the readers, am I persuading you? Are you with me, friends? Do you accept what I'm saying? Are you prepared to believe what I'm telling you about Jesus? Because if you do, you will have eternal life. John's method, let me remind you of this. I think we may have uh, had this a few weeks ago, but let me remind you, it's so important to understand how John is, is writing up his gospel. What he gives us is evidence based upon eyewitness testimony, evidence which leads to belief, which in turn leads to eternal life. Evidence leads to belief, leads to life. That's the constant underlying structure of the way John presents his material. Now let's see how he does this here in our passage. Look with me at chapter 19, verse 35. He who saw it has borne witness. Now he's talking here about himself, John. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. I'm telling you the truth. I'm bearing witness so that you may believe. Or to put it simply, I'm telling you the truth, and I know it's true because I saw it with my own eyes. I'm passing on to you eyewitness testimony so that you might become believers. So look at that verse. What is it? What is this thing that he has seen that he writes about in verse 35 to which he's now bearing witness? Well, it's recorded there in verse 34, and it's rather odd. What John saw was one of the Roman soldiers picking up a spear after Jesus had died and then piercing his side with the spear. And, here's the important thing, 
blood and water immediately flowed out of the incision which the spear had made. Now, why does John imply in verse 35 that this flow of blood and water is so significant? So significant that it should help the reader to become a believer. Now, let's remember that John was writing up uh, all this event, all these events, uh, some 50 years after it happened, probably between the year 80 and the year 90 AD. Now, in that latter end of the first century AD, there were plenty of people around who were not willing to believe that Jesus was really a man. What they were teaching was that he appeared to be a man, but he wasn't really a human being. And their reasoning was this. They said human flesh is part of the material world, and the material world, by definition, is evil. So how could the pure Christ of God possibly inhabit an evil body? So what they taught instead was that Jesus appeared to be a man, but he wasn't truly a man. Now, John will not have this for a moment. To him, it's false teaching, and he flatly denies it. This is why he says right back at the beginning in his first chapter, the word became flesh, human flesh, and dwelt amongst us. The word incarnation means that Jesus became a real human being. Like the rest of us, he had flesh and bones and blood and sweat. He got hungry. He got tired. He had to sleep just like any other human being. He was a real man. And this also explains why John begins his first letter in the New Testament in such a peculiar way. He writes this, that which was from the beginning, he's talking about Jesus, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it. That's the same point that John is making there. He's refuting this false idea that Jesus was not truly a man. No, he's saying, of course he was a man. He is a man. I've touched him. I've seen him. I've heard him. I know the evidence of my senses. Now come back to chapter 19 and verse 34. The soldier's spear goes into Jesus' side and outflow two elements which demonstrate that a real human being has really died. That's John's point. Jesus was really human, and he really died. Now, why does the outflow of blood and water demonstrate this? Because it was widely believed in both the Jewish and Gentile cultures of the ancient world that the human body consists of blood and water. Now, I realize that modern physiology would regard that view as oversimple. But modern medicine does confirm that if a body were to be pierced soon after death in the way that Jesus' body was pierced, the outflow would probably take the form of blood from the heart and a separate quantity of clear liquid which would have gathered after death in the pericardial sac. Now really, we need not get too anxious about the anatomical details. The important thing to see is that John's point is that Jesus really died. A real man has truly died. And that, he is saying in verse 35, is a powerful reason for putting our trust in Jesus. Now, the final paragraph of the chapter, verses 38 to 42, is here to establish just the same point beyond a shadow of doubt. And John goes very carefully into the details so look with me at the verses. Joseph of Arimathea comes in verse 38, and he asks permission from Pontius Pilate, the governor, to take away, look at the words there, to take away the body of Jesus. So Pilate gives him permission, and end of verse 38, he comes and he takes away his body. Then Nicodemus comes also in verse 39, bringing 75 pounds weight of myrrh and aloes. So, verse 40, they took the body of Jesus. Do you see how three times John uses this word body, corpse? Then verse 41 tells us about the location of the tomb in the garden. And verse 42 tells us that they had to bury Jesus' body uh, in haste because 
The Sabbath was just about to begin. The rule was that when the sun went down over the horizon, the Sabbath day begins. So you've got to do your burying activities before the Sabbath because you couldn't bury somebody on the Sabbath. So what is John's point? This was a real death. There was a real body. And this body was really buried. So why is John so insistent that Jesus was a real man who really died? Let me take those two points in order, his real humanity and his real death. Think first about his real humanity. John knows that only a real human being can represent the human race to God. And Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins as our substitute and also as our representative. Now, we know how the principle of representation works. Think of Parliament. We're all represented by an MSP in the Scottish Parliament and by an MP at at Westminster. And that member of Parliament goes to the Parliament with our concerns, representing them. He or she speaks for us, votes for us, acts as an advocate for the things that we think are important. But we can only be properly represented by a human being. A hedgehog could not represent us in Parliament, could it? A poodle would not be a good representative for us. We might occasionally think that a poodle would do better than the person who does actually go to Parliament for us. But the principle is clear. Human beings can only properly be represented by another human being. So if Jesus only appeared to be a man, but wasn't actually a human being, the gospel would be a sham. Paul insists on this very strongly when he writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And the word he uses there for man is a very strong word. It's the word anthropos. We get anthropology from it. What it means is a human being, not just a male man, but a human being. In fact, Jesus provides a two-way representation. As God, he represents God's concerns and commands to the human race. And as a man, he represents man's plight and man's needs to God. And it's such a comfort to us to know that our mediator truly understands what it is to be a human being. He knows our pressures and our stresses. He knows our sufferings. He knows what it's like to struggle. He knows what it's like to be opposed fiercely by other people, to be battered by life. If during his time on earth, he had merely appeared to be a man, but he wasn't actually a man, we would have to regard him as a golden angelic being who knew nothing of our tears and our pain. But the Bible teaches us that he is a man of sorrows, that he's acquainted with grief. So it's a comfort to us to know that we're represented by somebody who knows from the inside what it means to live a truly human life. Now let's turn secondly from his real humanity to his real death. This is what John is emphasizing. And of course the two things go hand in hand because if he wasn't a real human being, he couldn't have died a real human death. But this teaching of John that he really died does raise questions. Some people have flatly denied that he died, and some people still do. So, for example, the Quran, the book of Islam, says, speaking of Jesus, it says, they did not kill him, neither did they crucify him. It only seemed to be so. So while Islam regards Jesus as a prophet and even reveres him as a prophet, it's not the real and true Jesus that they revere. They've rewritten things, they've reshaped him, and thus they deny something which is at the heart of the true gospel. And yet even for Christians, there's something here to fill us with wonder. Charles Wesley expresses it so well in his famous hymn when he writes this, "'Tis mystery all, the immortal dies." Now there you have the problem expressed very pithily. How can the immortal die? Well, the answer to that question lies in understanding the two natures of Christ, that he is both fully God and fully man. As God, he cannot die. 
one of the fundamental characteristics of deity is immortality. Paul uses a great phrase in Romans chapter 1 when he speaks of the immortal God. As God, Jesus cannot die, but as man, he could die and he did die. Let me quote his great words from John chapter 10. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge, this authority, this authorization, I've received from my Father. So Jesus has the power, the authority, both to lay down his life, to die truly, and to take it up again. No one takes my life from me. At the most important level, therefore, he was never at the mercy of men. Even when they were nailing him to the cross, he was the master of the situation. But he really died. Look again at John 19, verse 30. He said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, the fact that Jesus really died has two very wonderful consequences for us, and I'd like to explain them now. Here's the first. His real death demonstrates that he really bore God's punishment for our sins. At the heart of the gospel, there is a great exchange, and the exchange is this, that Jesus' righteousness in the sight of God gets put to our account, and our sinfulness in the sight of God gets put to Jesus' account. This is what the Bible means by Jesus bearing our sins or bearing the consequences of our sins. The whole foul weight of our sinfulness was, as it were, strapped upon Jesus' body as he went to the cross. And on the cross, he received the wages of sin. Our sin, not his own. And the wages of sin is death. Now, the exchange takes place in that it was we who deserved death and should have been punished with death, but Jesus changed places with us. But there's a double exchange here. It's not simply that he took the consequences of our sin. It's equally true that God clothed us with Jesus' righteousness. It's nowhere in the Bible put better or more clearly than this. Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For our sake, writes Paul, for our sake he, that is God the Father, made him, that is Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made Jesus to be sin, he knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So he, clothed in our sin, dies for our sin, and we, clothed in his righteousness, are accepted by God and forgiven. Now, we're getting to the point of why John wants us to understand that Jesus really did die. There are some people, opponents of the gospel, who have said, this exchange you talk about is just a figment of people's imagination. It's just a kind of wishful thinking. People will say, you're kidding yourselves, you Christians, to think that Jesus' righteousness in the sight of God has been put to your account. How can you possibly know that you are now regarded by God as righteous and forgiven? Well, the answer is simple. We can know it, and we do know it, because Jesus died. The fact that he died demonstrates that our sin really was put to his account. Nothing else could have killed him. So his real death demonstrates that his side of the exchange has truly taken place. And that's why we can be sure that the other side of the exchange has also truly taken place. Namely, that we who trust Jesus have really had his righteousness put to our account in the sight of God. If Jesus had not really died, we could have no assurance that our sin had really been dealt with. But his real death demonstrates that the wages of our sin have been truly paid and received. And it's Jesus who has received those wages and not us. So where does it leave the one who trusts in Jesus? The answer is forgiven, freed, counted as righteous in God's sight. That great burden of sin, the penalty of sin, truly 
and fully and permanently lifted off our shoulders. This is why John is so insistent that we understand that Jesus really did die, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. In that great fact lies our assurance that our sins are forgiven. Isn't God kind and wonderful to have provided us with a savior like that? But there's another reason for John insisting that Jesus really died. And that is that if he were not truly dead, he could not have been truly raised. Look at the final verses of chapter 19 here. Joseph and Nicodemus go to Pilate. They ask for the body of Jesus. And then we can say they lovingly and reverently performed the Jewish burial rituals. By the way, just notice that it must have been very costly for them. They'd both been undercover secret disciples of Jesus. Joseph, as verse 38 tells us, had been a secret disciple because he was frightened of the Jewish leaders. And Nicodemus, as verse 39 reminds us, had initially sought Jesus out under cover of darkness. He didn't want to be spotted and identified as somebody who was interested in the strange rabbi. But here at this stage, Nicodemus provided 75 pounds weight of spices. That must have cost him an arm and a leg. And Joseph, we find this out from Matthew's gospel, Joseph laid Jesus in his own new tomb. That must have cost a pretty penny as well. And even more so, both of these men ran the gauntlet of approaching Pontius Pilate. There's a challenge for us here, isn't there, if we're tempted to be secretive or secret disciples. But, and this is really the point, the chapter ends after all the shouting and the tumult and the horror of the three crucifixions. It ends quietly on that evening in early April in a garden, a burial ground, and these two brave men gently laying the body of Jesus to rest. It's almost as though John ends the chapter not with a full stop, but with a dot, 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 dot. Because we then have a pregnant pause of 36 hours or so until that stupendous moment on the Sunday morning when he burst forth from the tomb, not merely revived or resuscitated, but raised from the dead. If there's no death, there can be no resurrection. But if there is a real death, there is a real resurrection. And the real resurrection of Jesus means that the power of death over the human race has been decisively broken. The cobra's fangs have been drawn. O death, where is your sting? cries Paul the Apostle. Now, as I said a moment ago, there's a pause. It's like a pregnant pause at the end of chapter 19. Just look at that final verse. Since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. But as soon as we turn into chapter 20, we quickly realize that the story has taken a wonderful new turn. John, in chapter 20, is very understated, but despite his restraint, you sense a feeling of mounting excitement as he picks up the story. Let me read the first few verses of chapter 20. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That's John's way of talking about himself. Uh, And she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple. And they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I think he was quite a bit younger and possibly weighed a bit less than Peter. I guess that's the reason for it. He's fitter. Anyway, stooping to look in, he, this is John, saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then they went back to their homes. 
Now, friends, what John is describing for us here is the emergence of the new world. We're in a garden here, and in verse 14, a man appears who is then mistaken for the gardener. Now, think back to early Genesis. In the old beginning, the first beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he placed Adam as the gardener in the garden. But in this new beginning, a new gardener appears. This is the last Adam. This is the second man. As Paul describes him in Colossians chapter 1, the firstborn from the dead. John is recording here the beginning of the new creation. And central to it is the Lord of the new world, Jesus Christ, who has broken the power of death. Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 6. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Here he is in the garden, the conqueror of death. It was back in the first garden, the garden of Eden, that God laid upon the human race the dreadful sentence of death. And it's in this other garden in Jerusalem that that dreadful sentence has now been annulled. Now remember John's method here. He's presenting us with his eyewitness testimony so that we should believe. Look back to chapter 19, verse 35. He who saw it, eyewitness testimony, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. He knows he's telling the truth that you also may believe. Now look at chapter 20, verse 8. Then the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and believed. So in chapter 19, verse 35, he's saying to us, I saw with my own eyes the evidence that Jesus had died. And here in chapter 20, verse 8, he's saying to us, I also saw the evidence that Jesus had risen. The blood and water spilling from his side was proof of his death, and the folded grave clothes were proof of his resurrection. Now, friends, there are some glorious entailments in all this. It is plain historical fact that Jesus died, and it's plain historical fact that he was raised from the dead. But being a Christian entails much more than simply believing that these facts are true. The death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus become woven into the very fabric of our being if we're Christians. They define us. They determine the very shape of our life and our identity. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 6, that our baptism is a picture of our union with Jesus, our union with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Let me read three verses from Romans 6. This is Romans 6, verses 3, 4, and 5. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, I don't pretend to understand that last verse fully, but I'm quite certain that it's one of the most thrilling things ever to have been written by a human being. To be a Christian is not simply to believe that Jesus died and that he rose again. It is to be incorporated into his very person in his experience of death and burial and resurrection. Do you remember in John's Gospel earlier, chapter 15, Jesus says to the disciples, and this applies equally to us, he says, abide in me and I in you. He's teaching us in those words that we have the capacity to take him into our very heart and soul and personality, and equally that he has the capacity and the willingness to take us into his very heart and soul and personality. John's phrase is that we abide in him. Paul's parallel phrase is that we are united with him. And Paul also teaches that the Christian is in Christ. The Christian is in Christ, and Christ is in the Christian. 
But Paul's great emphasis is that we are united with Christ in his death and his resurrection. So what is this going to mean for us? Well, think of his death first, his real death. If we are united with him in his death, it means that we were on the cross with him in some wonderful way that we can't fully understand. We were incorporated into the very fabric of his suffering body. Because of him and the fact that we're there with him, our sins have been paid for, dealt with. Sin is no longer able to point an accusing finger at us so as to bring us down. We no longer have any obligation to sin as if sin were still our master or our controller. It means that when sin approaches us and holds before us some attractive temptation, we can say to it, be gone. You're no longer my master. I owe you nothing. I belong to a new master. The old relationship between sin and us, in which it was our master and we were its slaves, that relationship has now been broken by the death of Jesus. And the resurrection of Jesus is the other side of this wonderful provision of God. Because we are united with Jesus in his resurrection, it means that at one level we have been already raised. Not physically, of course, not bodily, but spiritually in terms of our future place in the world to come, a place that we're already beginning to enjoy. We already belong to the new world if we're Christians. This is what it means to be born again. We've been born into a whole new realm. We have one foot in the grave physically, but we have the other foot already in eternal life. All this means that the death and resurrection of Jesus shape our self-understanding and our identity in a way that nothing else can. Now, of course, we have secondary points of identity, our family name, our family history, our nationality, our work, our hobbies and interests, and so on. These all play a part in the way that we think of ourselves. But the determining factor in the Christian's life is the knowledge that we have died with Jesus and that we've been raised with him. And it is this knowledge that will give us confidence and steadiness as we face the struggles of our lives and as we face the implications of our mortality. Let's bow our heads and let's thank God. God, our dear Father, we thank you so much that you've not left us without comfort. Quite the contrary, you've sent us a wonderful Savior, our Savior, who has died for us and has been raised for us, in whom we now live and rejoice. And we pray that this great gospel, giving us steadiness and strength to live this life and to face our own mortality. We pray that you will write it ever more deeply in our hearts, filling us with joy and helping us also to pass it on to many others. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Well, let's sing together again. <clears throat> let's turn to hymn number 324, one of Charles Wesley's great hymns. Let's really sing this, friends. I love the way he starts this hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Now think of the tongue in your head. There's only room for one, isn't there? <clears throat> but what Wesley is saying is, I wish I had a thousand tongues because there's so much joy uh, that, that has been given to us by the Lord. So 324, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise.
we'll finish with some great words from Philippians about Jesus. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen.